Hey guys, what is going on? Welcome to another episode of Music Row Hideout, the show where you hang out with artists, musicians, and entertainers in Waylon Jennings' old basement studio. My name is Jury, and as always, I'm gathered here with co-host Ryan Poole. Well, I'll pass it to to introduce the guest. Well, tonight, on a very special episode <laughs> <laughs> of Music Row Hideout, the look of shock on your face when I'm like, <laughs> I'm like I know I'm trying to be a radio guy. Tonight on a very tonight on a very special episode of Sounds Music Row Hideout. Thank you. We have <laughs> a very special guest, Kent Blazy, who is a songwriter and an artist here in Nashville. Uh, I just learned this earlier while we were talking, but you've been here since 1980. You've got seven number one singles over the course of your career, including uh, for Garth Brooks mm-hmm. and Chris Young, uh, another guy Ronan Keating, who. Uh, is uh, an English Irish uh, guy, and he did "If Tomorrow Never Comes," and it was a worldwide hit, except in America. Really? But he sang, uh, what was it? Nothing at all. And um, oh, what was that movie that was so big? I don't know. But he's he's a good guy. But um, they they didn't like him in America for whatever reason. It's weird. Huh. Weird but that you, happens. But it's weird. You're you're in Italy or France, and you hear your song by that guy. You know, and you right. go. Well, that's pretty cool, you know, but they don't yeah. know who Garth Brooks is. So. We all know what that's like. And- yeah, well, <laughs> I didn't. Know, I didn't know what it was like either, but you know, I like it. Um, uh, the big thing for me was the first time I went over to Ireland to hear Garth play. He was like the Beatles, you know, and so they were all singing our songs back to him. He didn't even have to sing, and I started crying because I'm in another country, and these people know. Every song me and my friends have done, and it was just wild. That is wild. Yeah, and that was a pretty amazing feeling. Man, that yeah. must be, the experience of that just must be so, like, out of this body. Yeah, it really was, you know, and uh, I was even crying on my friend's songs, you know, yeah. <laughs> because it's like, well, here we all are. We just met this kid who was cleaning churches and selling boots, and now he's like the Beatles in Ireland, so Man. pretty wild. Now, it take a while for, for country to get over there? Country's always been country. Was, like, what kind of question was that? Like, like was well, the Pony I mean, Express? And, well, I assume like they didn't, like it's an American invention. To send a horse right. over right. over an ocean. <laughs> yeah, know, that, that takes, takes a while. while. <laughs> yeah. now, you know what it was? Um, country music's always been really big over in England and Ireland and places like that because it's really the same music that they grew up with where all the people moved from Ireland and England and brought their Celtic oh. and their music to the uh, hills of Kentucky and Ohio, and and there's that influence still. And But they're really into old country like Johnny Cash and mm. Merle Haggard and those kind of people. But for some reason, they latched on to Garth Brooks, yeah. and he became like the Beatles. I think uh, somebody told me that every person in Ireland has at least four Garth Brooks CDs. That was like 10 years ago when you could get CDs, but right. don't, don't get me started on that. I think it's a conspiracy, but uh, but yeah, it was just pretty wild, you right. know, to go over there and here's a guy that is just, people are going crazy over it. It's like, wow, in Ireland. So I was listening to your, your newest album earlier today. Thank you. And as I started going through it, mm-hmm. I started thinking... And you correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I'm right here. I'm like, this feels very autobiographical. It feels like it's talking about the journey of your life. Boy, this guy's more intelligent than I thought when I got here. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, you know, I guess that's true. Um, for me, a, a lot of my friends started playing guitar because of the Beatles. That when when they came on the Ed Sullivan Show, which was February 9th, nineteen sixty four. I don't want to out you, uh, you're for your age or anything. Right. <laughs> but were you alive then? Barely. Yeah. <laughs> but but I was enough that you know everybody was talking about it before it happened, and in Kentucky that didn't ever really happen because you got things like three or four months before after everybody else in New York mm-hmm. or L.A. But um, Again, the horses. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the, the horses didn't run where I was except around the racetracks. But, um, you know, it was one of those things where more people watched TV that night than ever had watched TV before, and the crime rate in America dropped during that show. <laughs> they were all busy. Yeah, they were all busy <laughs> watching the Beatles and— and, you know, I, I just tuned in because everybody else was tuning right. in, you know, and you're on the school bus and they're talking about it. Yeah. But um, How old were you when you're watching the... I was probably about seven or something like that, I think. Yeah. And um, 
it was just a crazy kind of thing. It was uh, we were coming off of Kennedy's assassination, and everybody in the country was really depressed. I mean, I remember as a little kid, and then it was like nine one one was after it happened. I was on the road, and all of a sudden, people wouldn't go out at night. You know, oh, and wow. a lot of the shows got canceled because of that. They'd come out during the day if you were doing something, but wouldn't come out at night. And it was kind of that way. And when the Beatles came on TV, there was a joy there that America needed. And they had never seen anything like that before. And to me, it changed the world that night, what happened then and the repercussions of the whole British invasion and so many kids playing guitar. Uh, you know, they got into politics, they got into uh, meditation, they got into the clothing. They changed everything that happened, and the uh, repercussions are still going on whether people realize. And so part of it to me was next year's the, the 60th anniversary of when the oh, Beatles yeah. oh, were wow. on the Ed Sullivan Show. And I'm aiming to make people understand the impact that they had back then because people these days we take stuff for granted, you know, like we were talking about Richie Fure and Buffalo Springfield and Buffalo Springfield was an amazing band, but I'll play it for somebody who's in their twenties or thirties. And they're like, well, it sounds like everything else. And I'm like, yeah, but they were the first people that did it. Like yeah, the birds, right. they it's were the different. first people sound like the birds now, but they were the first people that did it. And it's hard for people to wrap their head around that. And it's kind of the same with the Beatles. You know, they've influenced so many people, but people don't realize there was nothing till they came along. It yeah, was, it's very hard. So I'm 36. Right. So very much. I was born in 1987. So right. I grew up with the Beatles, and so is Jerry. We're both from 87. <laughs> so there was, there was, that's always been a part of the world as far as we're concerned, just like Egypt and, well, I guess Egypt's a country. You know, the yeah. Great Pyramids of Ga Gaza, not. Nah. Oh, fuck. <laughs> you're, you're getting all your countries mixed <laughs> yeah, up yeah. here, you know. Well, uh, no more tequila for you. <laughs> I haven't eaten anything today, so okay, well. it's going to be one of those nights. But it's just the Beatles have always been a part of it. So when you go back to the Ed Sullivan show, I don't forget, I don't remember the second song they played, but I know they played, didn't they play Love Me Do? Right. And was the other one? Uh, she Loves You. Okay. And the woo, you know, yeah. and, and nobody had seen anything like that before. It's really hard for me to conceptualize of a world where that doesn't exist. And I've, I've heard people, oh, Erica's trying, pull it over further. Pull, pull it over further. Erica's like looking it up. That's what she said. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is f fun time for the audience. We, we we periodically mention Wesley back there Googling things for us and fact-checking us. But uh, Wesley's sick tonight, so Erica, his wife, is generously helping us out producing. So Eric, we'll be asking Erica to fact-check for us Okay, tonight. We'll, we'll, we'll have her look up stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, just constantly. Everything we're saying is the truth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, Love Me Do feels, I, but I've heard, um, what book was it I read? was uh, by uh, the engineer for the, a lot of the Beatles stuff. Emmerich. Emmerich. Jeff, Jeff Emmerich. Emmerich. Right. His book is so great. Yes. And he, he talks about just how revolutionary those sounds were when he heard them for the first time. Or maybe that was Ken White, another guy. I don't know if you read his books. Yeah. yeah. And I think it's all kind of the same thing. All of it was revolutionary, you know. Um, back then, the engineers in EMI wore lab coats. Yeah. You know, and you couldn't turn anything up very loud. And, um, and was, you couldn't close mic. You couldn't close. No. And it was just an interesting thing. And they pushed the boundaries on everything, on what you could do. You know, they'd get in there and go, well, what if I turn the treble up all the way? What's that do? And ah, what yep. if I turn, you know, but that, <laughs> yeah. that's how they came up with all these different sounds and playing the tape backwards. And, you know, they were just ready to revolutionize. And, you know, I'm, I'm a big person who believes in uh, you can manifest what you want to have happen. And I loved it that when the Beatles were playing the shitholes in, in, uh, Germany for 12 hours a night, that's when they became a band, you know, and people don't realize yeah. what they went through, sleeping on the floor with the rats while, the, you know. Yeah, you've read Outliers, haven't you? Yeah. Yeah, I heard that in your song. You mentioned the 10,000 hours, and yep. that was Malcolm Gladwell's whole thing with them in Hamburg. Yeah, Hamburg. Hamburg? Hamburg? 
Yep. Yeah. Hamburg turned them into what they were. But uh, Lennon, every day when they were in these terrible places playing, he'd go, where are we going, boys? And they'd say, to the toppermost of the poppermost. And they ended up at the toppermost of the poppermost. Yeah. And this is when they're playing in these, you know, crappy places. Yeah, they're, and, they're uh, in strip clubs, right? Is where yeah, they were? Strip, yeah, pretty much strip wild. clubs. I mean, uh, Hamburg and a lot of Germany was just, after the war, was just pretty wild, yeah. you know. And they were right in the middle of it. And they were, I mean, Harrison was like 16 or 17, and the other ones were 19 or 20. And just just what they saw and what, what they had to do to get to where they were. Which is crazy. Inspiring, yeah. If you think of them in the early 60s or late 50s in Hamburg, I forget what years it was they mm-hmm. were there. But, like, so that's right mm. after fucking World War yeah, II. Yeah, right. not, not that far away. Yeah, like, how many years is that? Like, uh, 10? 10, 10, 15? Yeah. yeah. And, and that's, like, I don't know, what what war was 10, 15 years ago? Like, if we went there, would it be, like, going to Iraq? It'd be, like, yeah. it'd be like you and me going, like, taking the band to Iraq. And, like, we're just <laughs> <Yeah>. like, <laughs> right. <laughs> like, let's go see how this does, and we're going to play in strip clubs and, in Iraq. Right, just every night for years. We yeah. hear Germany, and we're like, Ger- German people, they're, they're very sophisticated, and they make nice watches. But that was, like, only a few years after, like, right. Hitler almost took over the world. Exactly. And, you know, Ooh. I think that the, the thing... The book that's never been written that I would love to see somebody was write was all the, those kids were war babies. You know, Graham Nash was born in a bunker. Uh, wow, wow. A lot of them were in the middle of the Blitzkrieg bombing, you know, and when they're like three, four, five, six years old. And the impact that must have had on them to get out of the bunker and here's just the whole town's destroyed and people are dead. And I think it gave them a fuck this, I'm going to do what I want to do, and I'm going to play rock and roll music like Elvis yeah. Presley. And it was like, I'll probably die young, but I don't really care, you know? And I think that was the attitude that they had. Let's just live yeah. while we're living. And You know, we're almost presently in the opposite effect. Th- this The present generation. Here's how, okay? Okay, I got to hear this. Yeah, if... if if what you're saying is true, that they're uh, they just went through the the vibe I got was like, okay, you just went through a war, the whole world could have been lost. So fuck this, all of society saying this, we're gonna do whatever we want with music, and you don't want us to grow our hair out, we don't care, fuck you. Right, right. that's what they did. We fought, literally fought in the war. <laughs> yeah, long the, time, yeah, I feel like our present moment historically, everybody is afraid to go against what the general society wants because you might get canceled, you might get put under your. You know, you might end your career by saying the wrong thing, and everybody has to be really, really careful. And there's like a company line that's put out there, and you know, just not to talk about certain things because you might get in trouble. So we're in the opposite. I don't know if everybody buys all those premises, but I'm like, we're in the opposite moment creatively, where I think artists right now have to be really, or feel like they have to be really careful to say things a certain way to not offend different kinds of people. Um, in, okay, so what you yeah. got to take into effect then is. Um, there was no social media. That helps. Um, BBC, one channel in England. Yeah. You know, mm. uh, we had three channels, if you were lucky, in America. It wasn't like you could do something and people knew about it right away. Yeah. And these days, somebody can film you with a, a phone saying something and your whole career's ruined. And yeah. And it was just a totally different thing. I would have been amazed what they'd got on the Beatles' phones back in Hamburg you know, oh, with man. the prostitutes and, <laughs> yeah. and everything else, you know. And, but now uh, it's like everybody's, you're, I just think like Gen Z and, and you know, millennials are like, have grown up in a world where you, you're, things you say, things I say on this podcast tonight could have ramifications, you know. Well, yeah, that's true. If the true. wrong person heard it. Yep. And it could be out there forever and... Nothing you can do about it. And so people are more in alignment, which is interesting because that feels more like at least how I conceive of, like, the 50s with people having just kind of a more oh, yeah. McCarthy era, hey, everything's fine, right? And, uh, but the 60s, so I'm still waiting for the 60s to come back around in that way where Boy, people kind too. of rebel and do something new. Well, and that's what the Beatles brought. It was something that nobody had ever seen before. They'd never heard music like that, never seen anybody dressed like that. And um, the moral fiber of the country was right in the middle of uh, so many different changes, and they just came along and kicked it in the butt and moved it along, like discrimination and stuff like that. You talk to uh, guys like Steve Cropper, you know, who was with the MGs, and 
half the guys were black and half the guys were white and the black guys had to find another place to play stay when they were out on the road with these guys and they had to worry about their lives because hey you're playing with the black guy you know and uh it was a whole different world and the beatles and all that pop music came along allowed like Cropper and his band to go out and play and people saw, wow, there's black people in that band playing with white guys. Nobody does that, you know, but it opened doors that knocked down doors and that's kind of what the Beatles did to me too. They knocked down a lot of doors of preconceived notions of what the 50s were and Elvis had started that, you know, with all the girls screaming and stuff and the Beatles were like the next incarnation of that with the Beatles girls going crazy and nobody had seen anything like that since Elvis, which was probably, you know, eight or nine years before that. And, uh, it just, it kind of shook people up. It's like the line in the one song, the, you know, the, the young girls, uh, the old men laughed and the young girls screamed. It was like the Mm -hmm. old people didn't get it at all, but the teenagers got it, you know, and they got it big time. And then there was just this flood of British invasion. And then there was the flood of the American invasion because of the British invasion and a lot of it was because the sailors came into Liverpool, which was a port town, and they brought American records in. And that's the other thing that blows my mind. It's like these days we want to hear a song. We go to Apple, put it in. Mm-hmm. There it is. These guys, Eric Clapton and the Beatles, they'd ride three hours on a br- bus to hear Tutti Fruity by Little Rickard <laughs> or a Buddy Holly song just to, yeah. to l- really listen to it and hear what it sounded like. And now we just take all that music for granted and they took none of it for granted yeah you know and the guitars were shit back then amplifiers were you know and uh we we take all that stuff for granted now but um it was a different world in so many ways yeah that's amazing okay so this was the best segue ever to your first song okay you want to cue up tell us what the first song is and, and we'll give it a play well the first song that i did is called from the beatles to the bluebird cafe um That's the title of the record because I was over in Liverpool last spring and um, they have the Beatles statues on the dock there. And um, I was wearing a Bluebird sweatshirt because I'd done a benefit there a couple weeks before and it was cold in Liverpool. And somebody took a picture and I saw that me standing with the Beatles and I thought, there's your album title right there because Mm -hmm. the Beatles influenced everybody to do what we're doing now. You know, the sales of electric guitar shot through the roof and all that stuff. But then Garth Brooks, uh, I, I met him when he was cleaning churches and selling boots, and we wrote If Tomorrow Never Comes when he was doing that, and he couldn't get arrested in town. And one <laughs> night he got to play one song at the Bluebird Cafe because another artist hadn't shown up, and he sang If Tomorrow Never Comes, and somebody from Capitol Records who'd passed on him for the third time in a year that week came up to him and said, maybe we missed something. Why don't you come back in? And he went wow. back in and got a record deal. And If Tomorrow Never Comes was his second single and his first number one. So that's the Bluebird part of the Beatles to the Bluebird because I don't know where I'd be if that hadn't happened. And uh, it just opened so many doors after that. And he blew down the walls kind of like the Beatles did in country. So uh, it's a different world than it was because of that for me. Yeah. So that's uh, well, I won't I won't reveal my master plan for the episode, but oh, we're come right on. we're right on track. Ooh, okay, I like <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah, it's like all it. it's working out so nicely. I like it when that <laughs> it's good when that happens. But uh, so yeah, that's the song from the Beatles to the Bluebird because and it kind of tells my story about um, you know I was from Kentucky and everybody smoked from the time they were six years old up there because it was tobacco land, but. Uh, uh, this one kid three streets down from me, he had a Stratocaster and he wanted to buy another guitar. So he talked me into buying a Stratocaster, which didn't cost <laughs> what they cost now. And uh, he said, if you buy that, I'll, I'll teach you songs by you buy me sit packs of cigarettes. So that's what I stuck in there. That's how I learned how to play. You didn't have Google or YouTube where you could go and watch. Well, what's Clapton doing on this or whatever? You just kind of went. How do I learn this shit? I don't know. And uh, so that's how I learned guitar was buying cigarettes for somebody. Hey, whatever works. Yeah, whatever works. <laughs> the whole world changed in 64. 
My four kids from Liverpool Shaggy hair and electric guitar Man, it was a new kind of cool We had lo-fi on the hi-fi Blasting that music loud Sometimes I have to laugh When I look back on it now Got me a Fender Stratocaster Couldn't play a single lick A kid three streets down Would show me chords If I bought him cigarettes After all these years I'm still learning how to play It's been a long, strange trip to where I am today. Oh, and I guess I've logged 10,000 hours playing high school dances and honky-tonk bars. Never in my wildest dreams did I ever dream I would get this far. Oh, I sure have come a long, long way. From the Beatles to the Bluebird Cafe There were some times I was so broke I almost gave it up But I'm lucky I've always made my living Doing what I love what I love And I guess I've logged 10,000 hours Playing high school dances And honky-tonk bars Never in my wildest dreams Did I ever dream I would get this far Oh, I sure have come A long, long way From the Beatles To the Bluebird Cafe To our story, yeah, yeah back to our story because <laughs> okay. we're back, yeah, yeah okay. and we're back. Uh, ba- you know, back to our story. The 60s brought all this revolutionary, incredible changes, but that also brought the rise of the drug culture along right. with the counterculture. Mm-hmm. So, anyway, that was a good segue, right? Uh, yeah, that's yeah, well really good, <laughs> that was yeah. solid. Yeah, so it, I don't know, I, I mean, well, I think drug culture was a little different than though. Then like, the music culture. Yeah, it wasn't it wasn't fentanyl. Yeah, it wasn't and, yeah, something yeah. that was going to yeah. kill you, you know uh, what I mean? It was like weed uh, and cocaine, right? You know, <laughs> people were, back then would be going to jail for 30 years for having a joint or something, you know, on them. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, there really wasn't the, the heavy drugs that much. That was what they pushed at the time was, well, if you start smoking marijuana, you're going to end up a heroin it's addict. It's the gateway drug. Yeah, a gateway <laughs> drug. And, um, you know... Um, I think for a lot of people, what happened was they smoked marijuana and they thought, well, this isn't too bad. I think I'll try that other stuff too, you know? And uh, that that didn't help, you know, but... Uh, um, it it's was, a good point. You're like, well, they've been lying to me. Yeah, pretty much. And, and that's kind of what started this whole thing for me. I figured out at six years old, the government was lying to me. The church was lying to me. <laughs> you know, uh, they wanted us to duck and cover under our desk for the nuclear bombs being dropped. And I'm like, right. this is bullshit. I've seen videos of what the bombs do. Yeah. And then, you know, like I, I would be in church and they'd be talking about Jesus coming back. And I asked the preacher, well, what are the, when the people come out of the graves? What are they going to look like? You know, are they going to look like they did when they died? Or are they going to look like the, the zombieism? And boy, it pissed them off, you know. And and it was about that time I figured, okay, uh, I got to kind of do this on my own. Yeah. So yeah, it was a it was a different time, and and uh, we we were able to question everything. And people didn't like you questioning everything. Why didn't this work? Well, how can we make this better? And um, like you said, now people are kind of scared and uh, of saying anything that's going to be out of the norm of, of how can we do this? You know, like climate change has been denied for so long and, and you see the effects of it. And it's like, okay, well, 
Let's go to something else. <laughs> your, your grand, your grand idea. Let's go to your grand idea. <laughs> well, you know, before you get canceled, because you know our generation will cancel you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I ain't we're, scared. We're fucking narcs, all of us. <laughs> yeah, it's one right. side and the other. One side's gonna cancel you, or the other. You can't get away from it. It's... <laughs> yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, when you think about it. Um, our present moment feels a little bit like McCarthyism. It feels like that 50s kind of thing in a very different way. Right. Because a lot of the, the to me, the swing feels like the 50s felt like an uber conservative version of America and you better stay in line or you'll be, you know, banned, Ostracized. blocked. I mean, yeah. that's literally, if you guys seen the movie The Majestic with Jim Carrey? Uh-uh. I think so. Yeah, I mean, he, he was an act, the, He's playing an actor in the 50s who gets blacklisted because he had gone to hang out with a girl and she happened to be a part of the communist movement. Right. I mean, it was that simple little thing that could get you in deep trouble, you know, and it was just kind of a ridiculous thing. And uh, we kind of have that now, too, you know, where somebody like McCarthy can you got these people that can say something and and. With the media these days, yeah. it just all evolves and rolls down yeah. into something else. It's instantly and, crucified. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. And uh, but we we self report, which is like what those you know totalitarian states want you to do. Right. We self report. But the funny thing is, is uh, you know, I it's kind of there's a very uber liberal version of that, mm-hmm. but there's also a uber conservative version of that. Right. And and it's kind of like everybody's telling on everybody and like, look what they did, yeah. you know, and, and if you can get enough steam on your thing online of ostracizing a person, you might actually be able to destroy their career or their lives. Exactly. Because of something they said. Yeah. And it... But there, I feel like there has been a lot more pushback against that lately. There has. The more and more I feel like as time is going by, people are starting to be like, wait a minute, what are we doing? And right. more people are realizing, like, it's not okay to be this way. And people are allowed to have different opinions than you. Like, I don't understand why that's so hard for people to grasp. But, like, just because someone else believes something I don't believe doesn't mean I hate that person. Like, yeah, those are well, different things. You know, it didn't used to be that way, you know. And maybe back then the Republicans and the Democrats were different. But we had statesmen back there. We had people that would meet in the middle, in the aisles, to get things worked out for what was good for America. And now it's everybody's got, like you said, their their own little thing, and they don't want to cave in, and so we we don't get anything done. Right, because nobody know? will move in a, even a little bit. Yeah, nobody, nobody wants to give in a little bit, and it's just kind of crazy to me um, when you see what's happening to our infrastructure and all that. It's like, come on, guys, let's get along here and uh, and pull together for the country. But I don't see that happening. So it's it's a if a different time. Yeah, and in the meantime, while we're all bickering. Everyone yeah. at the top is just taking well, advantage. What, well, you know, trauma <laughs> and drama sells. And yep. social media has done so much for that of, you know, things turning on a dime on what mm. anybody does because of, you know, you can be caught on a phone saying something or on a, a video and, and your whole life can change. Right. And, you know, I remember um, my, my stepdaughter's dad told her when she was going to Belmont and she was kind of a wild little thing. He said, you need to be careful what you post on Facebook because – your employer might look at this uh, five years from now and go, I don't want to hire that person, you know. Yeah. And that was the first time for me, because I don't do any of that stuff, that it was like, well, you really have to be aware of what you're putting out there because you don't know who's going to see it and yeah. how it's going to come back to you. And it's just more and more like that all the time. Yeah. I mean, heck, if you're going to Belmont, Belmont might see it and not like well, it and exactly, kick you right out. Yeah, exactly <laughs> right. So, uh, yeah, it's 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 a different world than it was back then. And uh you know, it took a long time for people to find out what somebody else said, unless you're you're on the nightly news, which was only 30 minutes back then. If you were lucky, it wasn't 24-7 on any of this stuff. And uh, it's just interesting to see how things have evolved or devolved or revolved. Or Yeah, still trying to figure it out, you know. Yeah. Hopefully things will even out at some point. I figure the pendulum's got to swing back the other way, right? It's how yeah, it goes. Uh, that, well, you know, I used to think that, and people say that about music, too. Well, it's going to swing back and mm-hmm. be more organic like it was or whatever but um I, I don't see that happening it's just more and more you know it's like you can you can make anybody sound really good in the studio now you can mm. pro tool you can do the whole thing and it's kind of like with the movies you know like the 10 top movies 
uh, that were really like Forrest Gump movies or something in the last year. They made forty million dollars, where Spider Man made four hundred and fifty nine million dollars. Oh so everything that's computer generated is what they do with the movies these days, and that's kind of what it is with music. Um, uh, a friend of mine works at the Grand Ole Opry, plays piano, and these young kids come out and they're like, "Well, I want to play with my tracks." And they're like, "The mm -hmm. Grand Ole Opry doesn't use tracks." Well, I've never played with the band before. <laughs> and here they got a record deal, and you're going, wow, okay, has it gotten to that, you know? But yeah. uh, it's, it's that whole that. thing of anything can appear to be what it is, whether it is or not. And it didn't used to be that way. You know, when you went to tape, you went to tape. And if you go back and listen Which, to, incidentally, yeah. we don't talk about this that much on the show. You'd see it if you watch the video, which you can watch on Spotify or YouTube. But you go to tape. We went to tape today. I love yeah. that. I love tape. At literally know? tape. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, and we also, we don't tune the vocals of anybody who comes on the show. What you hear is exactly what they did. And they As did, it should be. They did one take or two. In today's case, we did two takes because I fucked up and didn't have enough tape on the reel. And we ran out of <laughs> tape and I missed the last chorus. But uh, you pretty much hear the first or the second take. Yeah. Anyway, incidentally. As, as it should be, you know, hey, do it or don't do it. Can you do it? Okay. All right, then it's good. Yeah, then do yeah, it. Then do it, you know. So, yeah, I've been making that argument. To, mm -hmm. to Ryan for a lot of years because, like, I, I'm very much of the opinion, like, when I go see a band play live, I want to see every sound mm -hmm. be recreated right then. That's right. what live means. Exactly. Like, I've never been a fan of, like, the tracks and stuff, but same thing like what you were saying with movies. Uh, me and my wife were talking about this the other day, but in the movie uh, Hocus Pocus, mm -hmm. big Halloween movie right from the 90s, uh, there's a scene where a guy comes out of the grave and he opens his mouth and all these moths come out. Right. Well, the way they did that was they had a ball that had a bunch of moths in it, and he put it in his mouth. Right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> nowadays, it would just be like three buttons, you know, and now you have magical generate. moths coming out. Yeah. But it's not as authentic. Like, you can see the difference. Like, you can still see when something is CGI. Yeah. And you can see what that guy feels like with having the moths in his right. mouth before it gets uh Yeah, that authentic really, emotion. Yeah, like that's he, exactly right. And yeah, that's yeah. A, a lot of what, to me, is myth, missing is an authentic emotion yeah. of, of what really moves you, you know. Uh, it's just instant these days. Mm -hmm. What else can we do? Where can we Instant go? Instant gratification. Can... One minute videos mm -hmm. only, then we move on. Yeah. You know, you know uh, it's 10, ten minute shows, you know, because mm -hmm. our, our span is pretty short anymore <laughs> yeah. thanks to the phones and everything else. So. Right. Now, a second ago, you mentioned Forrest Gump. Yes. And uh, to reveal my master plan for this episode. Ooh, I'm oh, glad wow. I mentioned that. <laughs> as I was listening, as I started listening to your album, I thought this interview could be like Forrest Gump. Ooh, I like now, that. Have you ever read the book Forrest Gump? Mm-hmm. Really? Yeah. You're the first person I ever asked that said yes. Well, and that guy also wrote a really great book about the Battle of Nashville. Really? Yeah, yeah, which really surprised the hell out of me. Yeah. But uh, he's a big expert on this battle, which was, uh, when I moved to town, nobody even acted like it existed. But he <laughs> wrote a whole great book about that. But, yeah, uh, great, great writer. You know, it's like I loved the movie so much I went out and got the book. And uh, Yeah. I used to read. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, we, years ago, on a road trip back from Montana, uh, me and my sister and my dad— your what? wife. My wife. That's what, what you're supposed to say. Okay. Oh, yeah. oh, Whenever yeah. I say my sister, you say my yeah. wife. Yeah, but you ended with your dad. It's confusing. So I was yeah, confused. Yeah, kind of fucked it up. <laughs> my father. My father? Wife. Anyway, there so we're, we're driving back. Um, I guess at my at my grandma has a ranch in Montana. Right. She had, for some reason, Forrest Gump on audiobook. Mm -hmm. And so we listened to it, and uh, I realized that that book is very different than the movie. That's it has usually a lot of the happens. same scenes, but right. there's a lot more to it. Mm -hmm. And the whole thing with Forrest Gump, which you get more from the book than the movie, is that Forrest Gump lived this crazy life and it was just bigger than life. He you know, he went to space in the in the book. Right. He went to space in the book. He went book? to space and he crash landed <laughs> in the jungle and then there's headhunters. Yeah. Forrest Gump, the whole the whole premise and you see it in the movie, but it's it's less evident mm -hmm. is that Forrest Gump was a part of every major historic event of the mm, 20th century. Right. Gotcha. And so listening to your album, which starts at you in 1964 and the Beatles and mm -hmm. then goes to the Bluebird and goes to now, I'm like, this fucking interview is going to be <laughs> Forrest Gump. I, I want to hear. <laughs> and so far we're on track. So take me to Vietnam. 
Well, what you the know, fuck was that? <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, that, that was another one of those things of, of your going, you know, my dad served in World War II or whatever. And, you know, those guys had a different view of things, saving the world. And uh, Vietnam was the first time that like Walter Cronkite and some of these mm. people, David Brinkley, would show what the hell was happening over there. Because uh, the government didn't want people knowing all the body bags and how many people are getting killed. And, uh, you know, it, it was just you could see that it was really a stupid thing. And yeah. I would I would read how we got into Vietnam with the, the, the France people being over there first. And then, you know, they got out of there and then somebody else got out of there. But then we decided to get over there, yeah. just uh, like Afghanistan. You know, it's like, mm. what's the matter with you people? You know, and... Uh, and it's like finally it came down to in the late 60s, they just needed bodies, you know. Oh, you're A1, get over there. You know, it's just to send these old kids off to war. They didn't give a damn. And uh, it, it had a big impact on me. And I had friends that went to Canada and, uh, wow. you know, other people that were taking massive doses of LSD or speed, you know, when they go in for their physical and, uh -huh. you know, that Trying kind of thing. Trying to get discounted. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, I think that was... Some, were you, were you drafted, or are you no, too young for that? I, I was too young. Yeah, I, I was just under the wire of that. You know, yeah. uh, it was ending. Um, near the end, what they were doing is um, they couldn't draft everybody because right. everybody was raising so much hell about that. So they went to a, a lottery. Yeah, and you know, friends of mine that were older than me, they got the wrong numbers. You could be like you and I could be born a day apart, and he'd have number eight. And, he, and yeah. I'd have 360, you know, <laughs> and you just go, oh, well, okay. But, you know, I had friends went went over there, and uh, they didn't come back the same, you know, older people that I knew. And uh, it was the first time that there was that post-traumatic thing that nobody talked about then. Mm -hmm. Nobody knew what it was, and now it's a totally different thing. But Well, back in World War II, they just beat their wives, and that was okay. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> and, you know, basically, yeah. nobody, nobody... Sorry, Erica. <laughs> nobody who came back from, from World War II talked about it much, mm -hmm. you know? They didn't want to talk about it. They was like, they were moving on in their lives. They were moving into the 50s. They were chasing that American dream. And, you know, they were heroes mm. when they came home, where in Vietnam, they weren't heroes because it yeah. was really not a war that was ever won. And uh, it was really tough on the troops that came home. Well, I went over there and fought for nothing, you know, and mm. yeah. uh, some of the stories you'd hear about, you know, the, the guy next to you wake up in the morning and he's dead because the Viet Cong came in and slit his throat in the middle of the night and you're sleeping right next to him, you know, and it's that kind of thing. You're fighting an enemy you didn't know anything about. And in Germany, it was different, you know. It's like you knew those people. You knew the people in France. But over in uh, Asia, you didn't know how those people did right. anything. You didn't know the landscape. It was nothing like American landscape. And so we were totally out of our element. And uh, it didn't really matter. Yeah. Yeah. Like there was no reason yeah. There's no real reason for us to go over there. Well, you know, I've got, I don't, I don't think it's on this record, but I've got a song on another record called Lies, Lies, Lies that kind of starts about, uh, you know, hiding under the desk because mm. it'll save you from a nuclear bomb. And you go, yeah, right. And it was that same thing in Vietnam. You know, they sent the young boys off to war. The old men didn't give a damn because there was nothing but lies, lies, lies. And that's mm. what it was, you know. Well, we're doing great over here. And then you hear about all these things happening and you realize we're not doing so good over <laughs> there. But, uh, yeah, it, that changed a lot of young people's minds on how to look at government, you know, it was evolving or devolving at that time into something. But I think the Vietnam War really separated what the government was from what the people wanted. And it took a long time. You know, we didn't get out of there till 75 or something. And uh, it was just crazy that it went on 10 years or more and uh, a lot of lives for nothing. Man, that's crazy. I honestly, I didn't, I hadn't realized that went on that long. Yeah. Um, weirdly, I feel like I learned very little about the Vietnam War. Maybe that's on purpose. But. Yeah, I think it is. I don't think they want to talk about it very much. Yeah, yeah. Let that yeah. one slide under the rug a little yeah. bit. And uh, yeah. So, Forrest Gump. Yeah, this is 
If you see me smirking during this episode, it's because it's everything I wanted it to be right now. <laughs> <laughs> you, want, you want to go through the journey? 100%. Um, <clears throat> yeah. No, I'm just I'm just really happy. Uh, did you ever see the, the – or did you read the book or watch the miniseries 11-22-63? Uh-oh. Oh, it's good. Okay, you're going to fucking love it. Well, you're gonna love it. Don't get me started on the Kennedy assassination. That was another mm-hmm. thing that I was like, I would love to. Hear oh, I would love to hear about please, that. <laughs> God, please. So, eleven twenty two sixty three is written by Stephen King. Okay. I think you guys are. I would love that. You're hella contemporaries. <laughs> Ele- Stephen King. I mean, he's obsessed. With, I'm. I'm obsessed with his books. Okay. But he is obsessed with that era, and so eleven twenty two sixty three is the story of a man. Jacob Epping is his name, and he discovers a portal to 1959 in the book. But in the movie, it's a little later because they didn't want to deal with all that shit. But right. he goes back in time, and he tries to stop the Kennedy assassination. And he's given this charge by an older gentleman that he works for. And uh, Don't say what happens. I'm not going to at all. Oh, come on. I'm very <laughs> gifted at this. So he's <laughs> basically... The whole – his whole thing is – the premise is everything changed at the Kennedy assassination. That's what ruined everything is that when Kennedy was assassinated, it changed the whole vibe and X and Y and Z and this led to that and led to that and that – to Vietnam War and the assassinations of uh, – Kennedy and Martin Luther King. Yep. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, Malcolm and, X. And then the uh, the other Kennedy, Robert Kennedy. Robert Kennedy, yes. Senior. Mm-hmm. And uh, – Senior. That changed the whole everything. Well, you know, I agree with that. And he's supposed that. to go back in time and change, and change it. it. And right. that's the that's what the book is about and him his journey doing that. Incredible book. There's a mini series by uh, on Hulu. It's mm. eight episodes, and they did. You know, the the movie's never as good as the book, but it right. was like a C plus book translation. I'll get the, I'll get the book. Yeah. <laughs> it's a real great show. It's, you know, I, I yeah. really agree with that because you know, as a little kid. Um, it was hard to wrap your head around what happened. It's like, this can't happen in America. You know, this guy, mm. um, you know, as a little kid, so many, every, all the kids looked up to Kennedy because he was young. We don't have 80-year-olds running for <laughs> office now, you know. I mean, is this the best two we can come up with? But that's a whole other thing. But, you know. Yeah, our, uh, our generation only has 80-year-old presidents. Yeah. What was it like having a young president? <laughs> it, it was so exciting, and that whole thing of, Ask not what you your country can do for you, mm-hmm. but what you can do for your country. I mean, that got so many kids on. Well, what what else can I do to help this place? Wow. You know, what else can I do? The Peace Corps was started. You know, mm-hmm. and and music changed the world in a lot of ways. But I really think zero times have we asked that that question. Yeah, <laughs> and, and so I think it, the Kennedy assassination opened up a reality that people didn't want to know existed. Mm. You know, that that could actually happen in America. Right. This brilliant young guy that everybody was so excited about running the country after all the old people we've had. And he gets taken out. And, you know, then the thing of, uh, of one guy up there with a single shot rifle can do that much stuff. And Yeah, that's what I was going to ask because you don't buy that, right? No, I never bought it from the <laughs> very yes. beginning. You know, it's Let's like. Let's go. This is the, yep. that's right. Oh, it's God. like this is bo- that was another one. How I ended up in this situation. <laughs> Hold on. Do you, you skip Bob O'Reilly? The next thing that happens oh, on that no. sound effect is Bob O'Reilly. Anyway, <laughs> but yeah, it was just that thing of um, so many people didn't believe that's really what happened, you know, and yeah. um, and you know, I went down to the the plaza and stood up in the the window where he supposedly shot that. And, you know, mm-hmm. I just don't see how somebody with a single shot rifle with a moving target could do what he did. That accurately. Yeah, that accurately. Under the pressure of I'm killing the president of the United States. Right. You know, your hand wouldn't be shaking at all. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, and uh, I really think that did change the world and it opened it up for the Beatles. Because yeah. everybody was so damn depressed, and they came along and brought another Someone reality happy. that hadn't existed before yeah. of of joy. And we America needed joy because we everybody was so depressed because Kennedy had been killed. Yeah. And did you watch the uh, Oliver Stone documentary that yeah. came out recently mm-hmm. on that? That like I was always like I don't believe it, but I don't really know. 
Right. I watched that and I was like, nope, the CIA killed Kennedy 100% <laughs> without <laughs> a doubt. Well, and I think that's what Robert Kennedy Jr. says. I don't know. I don't really listen to him, but I think that's one of his premises, Dude, I'm, you know? I'm, I'm, I'm a, a, unrealistically, I want to vote for somebody who isn't Trump or Biden for the next election. And well, I think everybody does, yeah. but what the fuck? Yeah. How did we get here? You know, it's I like, kind of one of the people I want to vote for is Robert Kennedy mm -hmm. Jr. Really, he's got a fucked up voice. I don't know if I believe the things he believes, but he seems to be like somebody. He seemed, I don't know, I heard him on an interview and I was like, he's pretty cool. He seems to be uh, fighting for truth. Well, my only problem <laughs> is with the third party candidate. That he's they're gonna, not going to win. Well, uh, well, that's the main thing. But who are they going to take votes away from? Because we can't right. let that guy who was in there before be elected again. That's my no, interesting. I mean, I'm not, I'm not a Biden fan, but I'm sure not a Trump fan. I mean, right. same. You know, the guy's he's just delusional, and I hope he's finally gotten caught. It's like, you know, I did this thing, Course in Miracles, for a long time, and it talks about different things. But one of them is a lot of people who do something stupid like Trump's done over and over, they want to get caught. Hmm. And he's never gotten caught. Like a caught. subconscious. Yeah, it's a yeah. subconscious, uh, you know, I want to destroy my life. And, right. uh, and yeah. it, it doesn't make any sense, but a lot of stuff doesn't make any sense. But he That's just true. keeps getting away with stuff and getting away with stuff. And people keep backing him up and yeah. backing him up. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's pretty bizarre. But um, yeah. yeah, you're totally right. People do, there's like, they're... If they've suppressed their conscious enough to be able to do something bad, their conscious is still there, and it tries to catch them. Right. It tries to get them yeah. in trouble. And, boy, he's tried and tried, and he always <laughs> he walks away from it. And yeah. it's it's mind-boggling <laughs> yeah. to me. But, I, I uh, will admit, though, I so when he first, back in, like, 2015 or whatever, announced mm -hmm. he was going to run for president, I was like, maybe. Right. This sounds you interesting. Know? A yeah. businessman. The reality show star. Right. Yeah. Right. And then after like three speeches, I was like, yeah, I don't know about that. Yeah. <laughs> it didn't take yeah. long. And, uh, you know, they talk about Biden not being all there, but you listen to some of the stuff Trump's been saying lately. He said something about he's running against Obama, you know, and you're what? going, yeah. <laughs> I mean, he said two or three things lately. I mean, shoot, <laughs> shoot shoplifters on sight, you know. Right. And, I mean, you just go, where are you coming from? You know, but uh, I, I listened to him the other day. Uh, so the, there was the Republican uh, primary debate. And so I watched that because I wanted to see who else there is that isn't Trump. Right. And so I want to see what's going on. So I watched that and it was interesting. And then but he purposely did not do the debate. Right. And then he did his own thing with Tucker Carlson. Right. So mm -hmm. I went and watched that. Mm -hmm. I was like, what's he saying? And so I listened to it. And I forget most of the things he said because it was, uh, <laughs> but the one that sticks with me. So I, um, back in July, I bought a Tesla mm -hmm. and he was talking about it. And he's like, these electric cars, they're not good. They're not good. Nobody likes them. They're terrible. You, uh, you, you so the best part of an electric car, the first 10 minutes. And after that, you're just scared <laughs> it's going to run out of electricity. I don't know. They're bad. They're terrible cars. They're tre tremendously terrible cars. Yep. And I, and I was watching it and I'm like, you fucking idiot. You've never been in one. I love it. Right. It's so cool. <laughs> I'm in love with this car. And he's like, no one likes them. They're terrible. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what's going on. Anyway, well, that's what I that has nothing to do with anything. But I just I it, hated him for shitting on my car because my car is awesome. Well, he just spews all this <laughs> stuff he doesn't know anything about. He just talks off the but, top of yeah, his head. He just kind of wanders and uh, he does. And people love him for it. Yeah. And they're like, yes, you're the savior of the world. <laughs> well, that's what the, the evangelistic people think. And it's like, how did this guy come up that you're supporting him after all the stuff that he's done and all the stuff he said and it's it's pretty bizarre yeah absolutely and we uh that's one of the the interesting things is like we've everybody in the uh in in the evangelical world in the beginning they were like this guy sucks and he's terrible mm -hmm. but we don't want Hillary Clinton right so we have to vote for him so that's what it is. But after like four years of defending him, they're like too all deep. All of a sudden, they're on board. It's like everybody's too deep. Yeah, exactly. It's like once you've said you're like once you're defending him, you get in too deep, and now you're like, no, he really is the best. Right. 
He's the savior. He's going to do it. He's going to drain the swamp. We, right. I knew like crazy, well, not it, crazy people, but people who I think are amazing, mm-hmm. but had some crazy ideas back during the pandemic where they were like, guys, what's happening is Trump is, uh, Trump is going to expose all the pedophiles mm-hmm. and he's going to save all the children who are being human trafficked. Mm-hmm. And so they're having to shut down the country for two weeks to be able to route the pedophiles out. And like people believe that, right? Yeah, they still do. Works. Yeah, it's just not real. But <laughs> <laughs> it's just all nonsense. But, but thank you to, for bringing a dose of realism. Jeff. <laughs> Thanks. But uh, to aggressively bring it back, yeah, we have gone <laughs> yeah. so far out okay, of uh, left get, field here. Yeah, let's get back to the, the, <laughs> yeah, the music. music. Can I just say? Can I just say it was Kent's idea for us to do tequila? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that is true. I, I can see it on your face. I can see it on you. But, but I did um, eat lunch. Yeah, true. I didn't. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm, it helps. I'm, it helps. Yeah. I'm in love. I'm like, yes, let's go all the way down the rabbit hole. Yeah. Yeah. Here, you bring it back. So we had, we had mentioned earlier, uh, or Ryan mentioned earlier in the intro, that you've had seven number one singles, which is an incredible amount. Color. Oh, oh. <laughs> is your phone hooked up to the thing? There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Erica, hey, that's good. That, that might be Uber Eats. She's got her <laughs> thumb up. I don't know what that means, but. Yeah, I think yeah. she's like, I got it. Um so what was the very, very first one? The first number one was If Tomorrow Never Comes. Uh, right. And, right. you know, the funny thing was I wrote it with a kid at the time who was cleaning churches and selling boots. Really? Yeah. Oh, wow. He, he had no nothing going on. How, and, did you, how did you meet this kid? Well, uh, I was telling you earlier, I had a... I had a demo studio because, like you guys, when you come to town, you got to have every iron in the fire you can think yep, of. So right. I was playing in bands. I was uh, doing demos for people. I was writing during the day. And so I started a demo studio. And if you sing like me, you needed demo singers. <laughs> and uh, so my demo singers were Faith Hill and Martina McBride, uh, Trisha Yearwood, Joe Diffie, Randy Travis. It's a pretty solid group. Yeah, they yeah, all fun. sang demos because they couldn't get you a record what? deal. We're going to cut everything about this episode and just start here. Okay. Well, <laughs> no. I've, been, I've been told that before. So uh, <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. I love this. but, but um, That's incredible. Yeah, and none of them could get a record deal. and But that's how you worked your way up mm-hmm. in Nashville back then is uh, producers or Uh, record labels would hear you singing these demos and who is that? And now it's how many social numbers do you have, you know? Right. But um, so Garth was cleaning churches and selling boots and he wanted to be a demo singer because he thought it would make more money. And um, so he (laughs) brought me over a cassette. People don't remember what a cassette is, but uh, he played me six songs and I said, yeah, I'll be glad to use you on some demos. And when he was leaving, he said, well, I write a little bit too. And I thought... Okay, this guy's cleaning churches and selling boots. He's got a big career ahead of him. And um, <laughs> so we we got together, and he brought in that idea that he'd run by 25 riders, and nobody liked it. Oh, and wow. uh, when he played it, what he had for me, I said, well, I love it. It's what my mother used to tell me about, tell the people you love how you feel about them while they're still alive. And so he said, what's wrong with it? And I said, well, you're killing somebody off in the first verse. Uh, like the first line of the song, there's really nowhere to go. It's like killing off the star of the movie in the right. first like, three minutes. Give it some time. Yeah, some and so he said, what would you do? And I told him, and we did it. And at the end of the day, we had a song, and we thought it was really good, and we pitched it around town for a year and pitched him around town, and nobody was interested in anything, you know. And uh, a lot of people passed on that song. And then he got that little three-minute Chance at the Bluebird, and the whole world changed Man. for him and for country music and for me. So how fast did it happen back then? Because nowadays, if if someone like uh, what's that guy's name who recently? Yeah, John. Uh, 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 oh, not John. Uh, uh, some all, not an- John Oliver. Oliver Anthony. Anthony? Yeah. yeah, yeah, with a Richmond North of Richmond. Like he put that on YouTube. Right. The next and, day, he was number one in the world. Right. I can't imagine it's that quick. No, it. I mean, that's that's the thing about social media these days. How something can happen that fast. Mm-hmm. Uh, back then, it was just this process that everybody went through of when you came to town. You, if you wanted a record deal, you had to go do uh, showcases for people, you know, and hopefully somebody would come out and hear you. Then you'd have to go have meetings with the record labels, and they'd probably all pass on you. And, um, you know, it was like for him, it was probably a year and a half before anything happened at all. And then um, that's a long time. Yeah, that's a long time. Yeah. And he was about ready to give up, you know. And the same with all these people that were singing demos for me. They, they, 
didn't happen right away, you know. And um, so when he got his record deal, his first single went to eight. And um, then the next one, If Tomorrow Never Comes, went to number one. And that kind of started the momentum. Mm. And then uh, The Dance was a big hit for him. The, the thing that really made it take off was Friends in Low Places. Oh, and yeah. that that exploded his career. And from then on, it was just rocking and rolling along. But, um, yeah, back then, things That's, happened really slow. Friends in Low Places is played in... Every karaoke bar yep. across the right. world, yep. every night. Every night, that's yep. right. Still to this day. I heard it. We heard it three days ago. Right. We yeah. were recording a podcast, and there was a he does a karaoke experience uh, using the studio. Right. And there yeah. was a group of uh, 13, 13, 13 gals here. From, yeah, I, don't, I forget where they were. I thought they were Canadian, but I don't think they were. Anyway, yeah, it wasn't were, a bachelorette it. party? It was. They... I, well, actually, I don't know. Or we had somebody party. else running it. It's right. hard to know. Right. But yeah, we we walked out there and we did some photos with the artist uh, in front of all of them. Right. Well, and the worst that's what they were singing. The worst part about uh, that song is that I didn't write it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but that took him to a whole nother level, and then it was just you know like a rocket after that. But yeah. Um, you know, it was just a slow thing. And the other thing that's funny is one of my demo singers was Trisha Yearwood. Mm. And she was my favorite female singer out of all of them. And she's still my favorite singer. And uh, so I kept telling Garth about her when we got together and he would be singing demos. And I was like, I got this girl you need to meet. And he's like, oh, I got a girl that sings my demos. I don't need to meet anybody. And so this went on for six or eight months, and he'd come over, and I got this girl. I don't need to meet her. I got this girl. I don't need to meet her. So finally I wrote a duet where they had to come in and sing on the same microphone at the same time. Oh. And the minute they started singing, even though their voices are so different, they could feel the magic and compatibility. And so when they got done, Gar said, well, what do you got going on? And she said, I got nothing. I'm just working at the Country Music Hall of Fame, and I'm working at a record label as a secretary. And he said, well, if I get going, I'll get you a record deal, and I'll help you get out on the road, and I'll help wow. you get a manager. And he did all that and uh, got her career going, you know, from Man. from a little demo studio in my house. So That's wild how that's that That's pretty happens. wild. And, um, you know, uh, Garsek's wife might not be very happy with me about that, that <laughs> I introduced him, but she's rich, so. <laughs> it's <Yeah>. something. <laughs> But that's the kind of, you know, that's the magic and the miracles of Nashville. You just never know what's going to happen. And it didn't depend on social media and it didn't depend on all this other stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, it's just, it was fun to see kind of the organic things happening, which I don't think there's a whole lot of organic yeah. happening these days. So do you think we've lost a lot of that or is it just different? Uh, well, it's different, but I feel like we've lost a lot of it. And the other thing that I th see with some of these country artists is that they do an anything that's controversial where you think would hurt their career, it embellishes their career and they mm -hmm. take off, you know, and right. that's a weird thing too, but it's just the state of where we are these days where nobody can agree on anything and there would have been a time that, you know, people would have st stood up to those songs and go, we don't need that kind of stuff to be on the radio or we don't need you talking about people like that. But these days it's like, wow, yeah, look what he did. Let's go buy his record. And it's a different mm -hmm. time. Yeah. Well, also used to feel like back before now, um, <laughs> people, when they said something, would like stand by it. Right. They would say something like, no, 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 this is what I think. This is what I believe. This right. is how it is. And they were okay with that if people didn't agree. It almost like made them stronger in it. Yes. And now it's, I don't know, it's just, if you're famous and you say something people don't like, you don't stand by it. You right. immediately back it. You immediately right. back it up. You're like, I'm uh, so sorry. Me. It'll never happen again. Right. I've never believed what I said. Yeah. Right. I, I, I don't A know. A ghost who, possessed me. That's right. And I. <laughs> and it just came out of my mouth. And, but but then whatever they've said comes back to help their career, even though it's right. something detrimental to somebody somewhere, you know? And yeah. that's a different thing, too. There's no winning. Yeah. No matter what you do. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Oh, that's rough. We're people, playing a real bleak picture. <laughs> yeah, future. Ever since Kennedy was shot. Yeah, yeah well, you know, sense, yeah. There's, there's something to be said for that. Where but. are we in the story? I believe we're uh, at— Just past uh, Vietnam. We had talked Nam, so now 80. Right. You moved to Nashville. I moved to Nashville, and— um, So what the fuck were the 80s? Because we, we didn't show up till 87. Yep. Okay. Don't remember so that much. We, we remember the 90s on. Okay, so what it was, we were coming off of the— 
they called it the urban cowboy craze, but I call mm. it the suburban cowboy craze. You know, <laughs> okay. it was that urban cowboy John Travolta mm. era mm. where country and rock kind of got together, but it's more like schlock, you know, <laughs> and there was a lot of really bad stuff during that time. In fact, when I moved to Nashville a year or so after that, New York Times said country music was dead. Oh, wow. You know, and I'm like, great, I just moved here and <laughs> country music's <laughs> dead. But then, you know, you had uh, you had so much urban country or whatever. I don't even know what you would call it. And then Randy Travis came along and turned it back to real country. Mm. And that started changing the whole complexion of what people were listening for, what artists could do. And it got away from that whole... Uh, I don't know, suburban country that it was and uh, took things to a different level and opened up doors for people like Dwight Yoakam or Roseanne Cash or uh, love her. Steve Earle. You know, Steve yeah. Earle calls it the, uh, what was it, the, uh, the, I forget what he calls it, but it's a great thing of the, the scare of the late 80s when you had Lyle Lovett getting signed and uh, Rodney Crowell and all these people doing great music and, uh, and, uh, it was all because of Randy Travis kind of opened the door and, and knocked stuff down on what could be possible and opened the door for, like, Garth to come along and the, all the people in the 80s uh, turned into the 90s and you had Travis Tritt and Trisha Yearwood and all these people get really big then and it changed the whole aspect of what country music was. Mm. But uh, and the, when I got here in the 80s, it was just really interesting. You had three little streets and all the all the little houses like this had all kind of magic things going on. You know, you had Chris Christopherson writing in a room like this, or you had uh, Dolly and Porter recording in a little studio, and they're all torn down now, you know. And to me, that changes the magic of what Music Row was back when I got here. And it was fun because you could walk down the street, and you might see Reba McIntyre walking down the street or something like that. And these days... It's just condos and right, you know. It's, and if Reba did try to walk down the street, she'd get mobbed. Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know? Well, there, there is that too. You There'd know, there'd be a so, bus going by. Yeah, yeah. What's incredible is like you lived this period of time that I tell people about all the time. Right. So it's very fun for me because I I talk to everybody about this period of time and it's all very hypothetical to me. Right. Well, I have a lot of young artists that I work with and not so young anymore they may be in their 40s and they're like man you were here at the right time you know i got mm -hmm. here in in the late 90s and it was it was the tail end of stuff and i wish i'd <clears> been <throat> there when it was this and this and yeah, this. that's what they and, told you too they told you it was the tail end they said country well, yeah, was dead pretty yeah. much you're like so, chet atkins is gone mm -hmm. but it, it's a different thing can we have somebody come along and change the whole landscape like Randy Travis did, or is it a different world with uh, instant gratification on YouTube and mm. Apple right. and all that kind of stuff? I don't know if another thing like that could happen, or like the Beatles or whatever. I mean, right. Taylor Swift's the closest to it. Right, but she's been around a while now. Yeah, she's like, been around a long time now. Could there be and, someone brand new who becomes that? I don't know. I think she was still here mm. when, you know, CDs <laughs> made a difference. And, yeah. you know, what happened was, um, just to get political... You know, they quit making CDs in 2016. And so that's how songwriters got paid, really. Unless you had a radio hit, you got paid. If, if the three of us wrote a George Strait song, mm -hmm. when the album came out, yes, we, would, we would get paid, you know. And uh, it may be a little bit, but we would still get paid. Yeah. But when they quit making CDs, they went to downloading. So we could have a song on a George Strait record, but if nobody... Uh, downloaded it, we didn't get paid. So it's like, hey, right. I got a George Strait cut. Why'd well, you make any money? No. Right. But then it went to streaming, mm -hmm. and we never see any money. You know, it's it's just crazy how things have dropped off. We've lost like 5,000 songwriters here in Nashville in the last five or six years because wow. they are they can't make any money. Um, and they're told when you're 45, you're over the hill, you know. <laughs> and uh, it's just crazy that it's come to that. But it's it's the young person's world. And um, well, like Spotify pays 0. 0.004 cents per stream, mm -hmm. and that money now I'm I do like an independent artist thing, and that comes to my account that I upload it from, right? It doesn't go to anybody else who's involved in the song, right? Unless I chose to make that happen for them, right? 
and uh, on a label they would be more it would be more actually kind of figured out right but even no matter what like the songwriter's going to get less and that's um i think i'm remembering this right it's different in england i think england pays songwriters for radio plays right oh, interesting. but the u.s doesn't we don't right that's, that's no. the u.s pays the artist only right is that uh well it used to be that they would only pay the songwriters Oh, oh, really? Yeah. You would get, if your song was played on the radio, you got paid, but the artist didn't get paid. The artist got paid because if they had a hit, then they could go out and play mm-hmm. and they'd make okay. money, Sorry. record sales and stuff You're right. like that. I'm in uh, tequila. Here, pour, it's pour the some more. Yeah. No, yeah, yeah. Pour for you. You need yeah. to get on my level. Oh, I got to drive home. <laughs> <laughs> Uber, bro. So. <laughs> Okay, yeah, it's the exact opposite of what I said. The The songwriter got paid, but the artist didn't. Right. Now okay. it's reversed on yeah. Spotify. And, uh, and how's the songwriter going to get paid unless the artist cuts him a check? Of that? Yeah. Well, yeah, and the, and the record labels, the money goes to the record labels for that. Now, whether it filters down to us, I don't really see it. Mm. Um, you know, um, but you do have a lot more independent artists, though, that don't go through record labels now. Right. So that well, comes straight you know, I mean, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I'm, I, most of my records are on CD Baby. I just went to TuneCore. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that's good or not, but I haven't seen any money from them yet. But I make more money off of CD Baby every quarter than I do the songs that I own publishing on that were number one records. Really? Now, how, where's that make any sense? That, not at all. Not at all. Not but at all. that's what it's come down to, you know? And uh, I, I've got friends that, like I said, that are in their in 40s. Low places. Well, they're in low places now, <laughs> depressed places. But, um, you know, they, they've had number one records or whatever, and they go trying to get a publishing deal, and it's like, well, who's your track guy? And what <laughs> artist can you get with? And I'm like, well, what's your job? You right. Know? But um, And you're 45, you're kind of over the hill, you know? And it's it's just a sad commentary on where we are these days. And that was another song on the record was Die Young, at a very old age that I yes. wrote about McCartney. And those guys are the inspiration for me because no matter what the music business says you are, they're still out there doing it. You know, Bob Dylan, Willie Nelson, um, Roger McGuinn just turned 80, you know, and they're still out there making really good music and performing. And so to tell somebody at 45 you're over with and right. make them believe it, you just have to reinvent yourself, but it's hard to do these days. Yeah, it's hard but, to keep up. Yeah, and uh, that was another song on there, Stay Wild. It's about all these people that are out there not buying into that, well, you're old, you can't do this anymore. And uh, I think we need a lot more of that. We got that woman, 104 years old, that just took her first skydiving lesson. I saw you know? that. Yeah, and it's amazing. God bless her, you know? it's she, like She passed away like two days later or something, right? right? Something like she like went that. skydiving like she always yeah. wanted to. And I, then, I did like, what I wanted later. to do. Yeah. Yeah. Straight up live like you were dying. Really, yeah. it really like is. Part of it. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, at 104, that's okay, you know? Right, yeah. So, yeah. I wanted to ask you about this. You just said like three things in a row I wanted to talk to you about. Wow, nobody's ever said that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I, so listening to your stuff, now I, I haven't mentioned this yet, but so you wrote a song called uh, My Best Days Are Ahead of Me. Correct. It for And then Danny Goki cut that. Right. So I've been working for Danny Goki for years. Awesome. Mostly on the video side, but we, right? we did do vocals here once for uh, one of his Spanish language songs, or okay. twice for Spanish songs. Right. Anyhow, so he's a friend of mine. Tell him I said hi and thank you. I will. <laughs> so he's, I've heard him play My Best Days bunches of times. Right. And, um, and so anyway, when you're, when y'all's or your published or not your publisher, your publicist reached out to us about the show. Mm-hmm. They it said my best days are in front of me, and I was like, oh my gosh, I've heard Danny play that song tons right. of times. Um, so you wrote that song, and then you just said the the die young song. Mm-hmm. So I was listening to that earlier today, right. and it's like I want, and I kept, I want to die young at a very old age, at a very old age, mm-hmm. and I'm like, that is very clever, right. And so I started looking at a lot of your song titles, and then what's the Garth one called again, the first one? Uh, if Tomorrow Never Comes. If Tomorrow mm-hmm. Never Comes. So I'm like, you're writing a lot about <laughs> uh, about not like letting, 
I don't know how to frame it right now because I wrote it down on my phone. More tequila. Not yeah. getting old <laughs> as you Stop get old. It. Yeah, about staying young, about you're writing a lot about like death. My best days are in front of me. You know, that song really worked well for Danny because what he had just come from was his wife dying. And see, I and went through the same thing. Lowest place. My Wait. wife had died of a brain tumor oh, just wow. like his really? had. And, um, well, she died of a heart a oh, heart okay. thing. Gotcha. But either way, a heart, a brain. Right. Yeah. Whatever gets you. Yeah. Some tragedy. And so, so um, I had this song idea uh, that I wanted to write to move on to a new life, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's like uh, my wife didn't want me to just lay down and die because she did, you know? And so that resonated with Danny when he heard the song because he had gone through the same thing that yeah. I had gone through. And, uh, you know, I thought it was a really great cut. And it went, I guess it went to like 12 or 13 or something. I really had hoped that it had done better for him, you know, because he did a great yeah, job yeah. on it. I but mean, 12 or 13 still not bad. Yeah, it's still not <laughs> bad. Still pretty but, good. Uh, but he know. was also, he was an idol artist fresh right. off of idol. And so it's like they do, they can do well, but like very few American idol artists have like made massive right. number one hits. Uh, it's like really just yeah. the first few. Yeah. Carrie Underwood. Underwood's about the only one, right. you know. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so I, I'm just glad that he chose the path that he's on now and that it's doing good. You yeah, know, yeah. I'm, I'm proud of him because so many of them would tuck their tail and go home. And he's like, well, I'm just going to reinvent myself like I'm talking about. And that's kind of what you have to do if you want to stick around is not buy into what everybody's telling you got to do and just go, okay, I'm going to do something different. And that's kind of how I've lived my life in the last 10 years or whatever. It's like I do records and I write what I want to write. And most people on Music Row don't want to write what I want to write or say <laughs> yeah. what I want to say. And that's fine with me. But uh, I'm having fun. And, you know, CD Baby pays me <laughs> better, than, better than BMI does. So, yeah. you know, thank you, everybody who buys any of this yeah. stuff. So when, when So you wrote the song My Best Days... Was it? It was out of the place of your wife passing away. Right. Yeah. So Danny, it was that like a, a, a anthem yeah. to myself of "Come on, let's let's move yeah. into the next thing." You know, yeah. it's like uh, I can either lay down and die or, or say my best days are ahead of me, and it's kind of the same thing about manifesting what you would like to have show up. Yeah. And um, well, I've heard him play that song. Uh, because I've gone and done video work with him on the road. I've heard him play that song oodles of times. Right. And he very much uses it as an encouragement to people. Right. Because of what had happened to him. And so that would, that's just so cool that that song travels around the country. Yep. Telling people like, hey, you might be in a terrible place. Your wife might have passed away or maybe something different for you. But your best days are ahead of you. And yeah. You have to believe in that. Yes. And, you know, a lot of my songs that I write, uh, my aim is to encourage people. Like, I want to die young at a very old age, yeah. you know, or if tomorrow never comes, it's like, tell the people you love how you feel about them. And that's always been my target to get something that encourages people to what else is possible from being stuck in this life they're stuck into. And why do you think you write about that so much? Because I noticed that as a theme through your writing. Right. It comes up so much. Well, I think that's what I always wanted to write because I felt like the joy that the Beatles brought with their music when they first came out, that moved me and it encouraged me and encouraged so many other people. You know, they all went out and bought guitars and a lot of them became big stars or songwriters yeah. or whatever. And so their encouragement is what I'd like to pass on to other people, that there's other possibilities beyond what this reality tells you are possibilities. But if you buy into what they tell you, like your career's finished at 45, well, then, then it is. If you then believe it, it is yeah. exactly if you yeah. believe it. But I'm out there just kind of saying you don't have to quit. You know, just because you're 60 or 70 years old, if you still love what you're doing, keep doing it. Yeah. You know, and that's what it's supposed to be. Life's supposed to be fun, and uh, right. And most people don't kind of realize that till it's too late. Yeah. My my wife brings that up a lot uh, in her life. She's like, I feel like I'm so old to like go after these things. She wants to go after whatever it is right. at the time. Yeah. Um, she's and, 34. Yeah, she's right. 34. She's yeah. not too old. Um, but uh, I always bring up the same story, which is the guy who started KFC. 
the colonel. Right, yeah. He didn't even open the first KFC till he was 65. Exactly. And he died hella rich. <laughs> yeah, he really <laughs> you know? did, you know? Like, not a problem. Yeah. Wow. You his know? face is everywhere. His and face is everywhere. Everyone knows what his face looks like still to this day. Right. They still have him talking even though he's dead. Yeah, he's been dead <laughs> for like, decades. I don't think he'd talk like that, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I mean, uh, that that's where like Dylan and McCartney and Willie Nelson and all those guys out there still doing it, they're, they're an inspiration for me because... You know, Bob Dylan just had his first number one record with a 15-minute song about Kennedy's assassination, oh my gosh. you know, and uh, he was probably 88 at the time or something. And so, hey, keep doing it, you know. That's so wild. They can tell you you need to quit, but you don't have to believe it. Yeah. yeah. Now you have, you say, so you've used the term a couple of times, um, and I've heard other people say the same thing before. Right. Um, but I, I kind of want to know what how you would define it, I guess, mm -hmm. which is you've used interchangeably the terms old country mm -hmm. and real country. Right. Um, you know, comparing it to like different generations. But what, right. what actually makes up real country? Like, what is that? Well, you know, country music, uh, when I was growing up and I was a rock and roller, I mean, mm -hmm. um, that's what I did, and I got into country music because I loved some of the guitar players that, like Merle Haggard, had, and and uh, Buck Owens and stuff like that. And um, but to me, country music was always about telling real life stories about real life. Okay. And um, I think we're missing that now with the bro country where it got into. <laughs> Uh, you know, you partying. These, yeah, it's partying. Sitting in well, the back of my truck with a beer and a bitch in the truck on a well, Saturday night. Yeah, and they've got a brand new Silverado and they're 16. I'm like, who the hell's paying for this shit? Yeah, right. You know, but <laughs> but it's almost it was almost like uh, what they were doing. The the teenage boys loved it because it's what they wanted to be, what they wanted to do. Sure. Even though they couldn't do it, but it was giving them. Hey, we could do this, you know. We can go out and have a bonfire and drink whiskey and drop, park out in the the farmer's <laughs> field or what, whatever, you know. But it was just, it wasn't. Re it's not real, and it was just the same thing over and over again. In fact, a couple guys did the mashups, you know, where they put the top ten songs. Yeah, I love for, those videos. For a year, and it, it's all kind of the same crap, you know. Yeah. And it was really missing about what country music is, and I call it, you know, the '90s to me had so many pull over to the side of the road songs mm, that just mm. move you so much you had to pull over and cry or sit there and think about it, you know, like uh, Ships That Don't Come In or The Song Remembers When or Walk Away Joe or The Dance or something like that. And I, I don't feel those songs being written now. And I think part of it is because the way the music industry's evolved where we have the 360 deals where mm. when you get a record deal... You have to write with the people that are involved in this where the money's all kept in the same. And so you have a lot of people having hits, but you don't have anybody taking it to another level. No one trying, no one evolving it. Nobody evolving. Nobody really writing those songs that move people to uh, appreciate what mm. life is, you know. I mean, you can mm. appreciate getting naked with a girl out in the pasture with your whiskey and bonfire but you know it's sure. it's not the same thing and <laughs> yeah. it wasn't like every song kind of was the same thing and uh, to me that was real country and you know it goes back to hank williams he was writing what he knew and what he saw and that's why people mm -hmm. still listen to okay. hank williams but i just feel like we've moved away from what's real and what the real demographics of people are to a whole nother thing, and yeah. and that's not country anymore. Huh. So so it sounds like it's so it's much less about necessarily the the instrumentation, the use of tracks, or the right. overuse of technology. It's just about the auth the authenticity of the message that they're trying to portray. Right, and part of it comes down to his tracks because you know when they go out and play, and this is just part of where society's moved to with with iTunes and all this stuff. When people go to a concert now, they want to hear what they heard on the record, mm. and so that right you can't reproduce what you did on the record right, unless you're a, using tracks. Right, that took or, a bunch of days and thirty people. <laughs> right, you know, I had a, a guy that I knew who played with Florida Georgia Line, and he said, you know, we were playing the tracks all the time, and I was playing ganjo on mm -hmm. most stuff, and he mm -hmm. said, just for the hell of it, I tuned it down a half a step one show to see if anybody noticed and nobody noticed. And he said, I quit the next day. He said, wow. you know, I'm up there doing it, but nobody gives a damn and nobody right. can hear what I'm doing. So why am I doing it? You know, yeah, you're almost and, like a music video actor. Yeah. 
And that's kind of what it's come down to. And it, where's the real in the music? You know, if you're playing the tracks, sure, you sound like the record did, but right. But know, is that good? Is that a good? Do you, yeah. you really even want that? Right. You know, exactly. or do you just want it because that's what sells tickets? Or do you, right. you know, it's, but is it really who you are? And, what you know, the say? players in this town are so amazing. Mm -hmm. They may not be able to replicate exactly what the records were, but uh, they can come pretty close. Yeah. But that's not good enough yeah. anymore. And, and you know what you don't get anymore because of that is long improvised guitar solos. Right. Like the guitar solo is this many bars. Right. This is, you if know. If there is that. If, if you have it at all, yeah. right? Right. Or before it's like, you know, I mean, I, I, when I was young, I was much more into rock than country because mm -hmm. San Diego West Coast was not into it at the sure, time. Sure, right. But like, I remember like, I used to watch videos of like Jimmy Page mm -hmm. and just be like, and now he solos for 15 minutes. Right. Just in the middle because they felt like it was good. And yeah. it was. And it, it was, was amazing. Yeah. yeah. I, I watch it over and over again. And you lose all of that. Right. All that's like, dead yeah there's not an improvision and right. that's that's a you know one of my fun things of playing with the band is just the improvision of what's going to happen in any given moment right. you don't you know? know different every time yeah yeah so yeah that's so that's that's the real thing to me is where something can happen that's magic rather than something's going to happen like it's happened every other time before exactly like it's happened right before. just copy and paste yeah yeah um, now, it has been a while. We should probably play the second song. <laughs> well, yeah. we don't have to. You know, it's... <laughs> now, the second song was your It first... did all right without you guys, you know. Yeah. <laughs> that's true. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We weren't even fucking born. <laughs> yeah. True. Oh, wait, wait. When, when, well, when, so the next song is uh, uh, your first number one. Yeah, it was, I went number one in 89. Oh, we okay. were alive? We were two. So you we were two? two? We yeah, were you two. don't remember it? <laughs> yeah. I don't. Dang. <laughs> she, she's that, laughing. not that important. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't that good. <laughs> she was not alive yet. I yeah. don't know. Yeah. <laughs> well, sometimes late at night I lie awake and watch her sleeping She's lost in peaceful dreams, so I turn out the light and lay there in the dark. And the thought crosses my mind if I never wake up in the morning, would she ever doubt the way I feel about her? In my heart And if tomorrow never comes Will she know how much I loved her And did I try in every way To show her every day That she's my only one And if my time on earth She must face this world without me Is the love I gave her in the past Gonna be enough to last If tomorrow never comes Cause I've lost loved ones in my life Who never knew how much I loved them Now I live with the regret that my true feelings for them never were revealed. So I made a promise to myself to say each day how much she means to me. And avoid that circumstance where there's no second chance to tell her how I feel And if tomorrow never comes Will she know how much I loved her And did I try in every way To show her every day That she's my only one 
my time on earth were through And she must face this world without me Is the love I gave her in the past Gonna be enough to last If tomorrow never comes So tell that someone that you love Just what you're thinking of If tomorrow never comes And we're back. <laughs> All right. So uh we're coming toward towards the end. We got a few more minutes, but uh so that was your first number one. We just got to the beginning of your career right here at the end of the show. <laughs> right. So we're gonna have to have you back. All right. I but, hate uh, it, but we can do it. <laughs> what so what happened? So you guys so let's just talk about that. So uh-huh. you you met a guy who cleaned churches and sold boots. Yep. And you guys wrote this song together. He had the song and then you helped him kind of figure it out the rest of the way it sounded like. Correct. And you guys demoed it. He plays it the bluebird, and now he's a, and then he's the a, right people. That that doesn't happen anymore. No, it really doesn't. No, and, you uh, can go play it the bluebird, and no one's going to care. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we've all just gotten uh, diminished by what's available out there online, you know. Yeah. And um, the other song that's on that record is we were just writing songs, mm-hmm. and um, that's kind of how it was back then. It wasn't like we were aiming to be superstars we just were doing what we loved to do and it was the same with garth we wrote a lot of his hits he wrote when he had he was cleaning churches and selling boots that became hits later on like thunder rolls and uh what she's Mm -hmm. doing now and all that you know and it was just we were just writing them (laughs) we were hoping something would happen but that's what we did every day we just got together and we wrote songs and um and had fun doing it and hoping maybe something would happen but and so what what was the trajectory after so he played were you there when he played it at the Bluebird or you just heard back from him? No, I just it? heard back. Um it was just another night at the Bluebird, you know, yeah. but it just changed the whole world that one little night of three minutes. And um So what what was it like? What tell me the story of like when you knew something was afoot. Because you're just doing your normal thing and right. you had written a song. It was just another song, I'm sure. Yeah, and I'm sure you loved it, but it was you doing that all the time. So yeah, when now, did you know I, something was going on? I was with writing with a lot of different artists and, uh, you know, hoping something would happen with them. And some of them it did and a lot of them it didn't. But um, where I knew it was different was he'd recorded If Tomorrow Never Comes and um, he had a showcase to play the whole new record for people that wanted to come here. And it was at uh, somewhere over in in Sylvan Park, and there were about 200, 300 people. It was kind of an album release party. And so he did the whole record, and nothing had been released yet. And so I'm thinking, well, this is good. You know, it's it's country. It's real. And, and then at the end, for an encore, he did Keep Your Hands to Yourself by the Georgia Satellites, which hmm. is a rocking little song. And I saw a whole other side of Garth I had never seen before. And I thought... If he does that and takes it out to the masses, he's going to be huge. Hmm. And that's hmm. what people, when he got out on the road, people would say, you need to go see this guy. If he ever comes to your town, he's swinging off the damn band- <laughs> chandeliers. He's jumping on ropes. He's jumping off the stage. He's running all around. There's nothing like that in country music. And that was what really got him going was uh show after show after show in different towns where people would start talking about you need to see this guy and uh it was really cool and eric church kind of did that with his career you know uh, capital records had put out a couple things and they weren't really happening so he just took it to the masses he just went out and started playing over and over till he generated this fan base and then all of a sudden he took off and that's the only other time i've seen anything like that happen that recently like that and uh it was just word of mouth before there was social media That's crazy before there was anything it was word of mouth if he's coming to your town you need to go see him man and, yeah and that was a different world yeah things don't yeah things don't travel like that anymore no they, they travel way faster <laughs> way faster but maybe not in a good way sometimes 
Yeah, it's hard to know. It's hard to know because, like, because you're right. Like everything that you say about like the digital side of things and how fast everything is, I'm just like, yeah, it's awful. But at the same time, it's amazing. It is, you know, yeah, it it's is, incredible it's, what we can do now. Yeah, it's both sides of the sword, right? You know? Like I don't, I don't know which side it lies on. You know, in the on end. any given day, right? Yeah, that's right. But it is, it is, it is. I don't know. The world is just even like uh, this is something I was talking about the other day. But um, so Gen Z. Mm-hmm. is having trouble adapting to technology. What do you mean? I read that. Yeah, which that you wouldn't think me. would be the case. Aren't yeah. they They're because they in it completely? Well, they've never yeah, but they grew up with it working. Mm. Right. We grew up like as millennials with like I didn't have the internet when I was a kid, a little, sure. little kid, right. and then I got the first version and it was terrible mm-hmm. and it got better and better, so we learned how to use technology. And people who were older than us they were already adults, so maybe they didn't learn it as well. Right. But they still saw the whole thing come from nothing to what it is. Right. But all these people who are born into it, it's like it's already done. It's a yeah. done project. They just have to use it. And now they're struggling to adapt. Yeah, because it's like that's all they've ever known. Right. Like they don't know how to write. You right. know, because they're all on their iPads yeah. in school, you know. I and, mean, cursive is dead. Right, exactly. <laughs> you know, and, It was stupid anyway. <laughs> well, and, and reading books, you know, it's the yeah. same way, mm-hmm. you know. it's uh, They'd rather play their video games or whatever than read books. And right. It's, it's a whole different world. And, and they are the ones that that's what it's been since the time they were little. You know, they, they, the iPads were their babysitters when they were two years old. Yeah. You know, and mm-hmm. that's all they know. Like, and Like, they don't know how to go to the library and look something up. Right. And they don't need to know. Like, yeah. it's not important yeah. that they even know that. You I'm, know, I so mean, that, I'm getting married uh, in June. I need to for, talk to her. <laughs> 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 now, and, and for the first time, so uh, you're looking at me like that's weird. I'm getting mm-hmm. married for, at 36, I feel like, you know, for the first time. Is, yeah, anyway, I, that's pretty good, actually. Yeah. I think that's smart. So getting married for the first time, and so I, I know a lot of people who did it a lot earlier than I mm-hmm. did and have kids and whatever. And so I'm watching, and they, a lot of my friends, their kids are babysat, like you said, by the iPad oh, God, or their yes. iPhone. Mm-hmm. And they're, we were just with a certain friend, Erica was there, with a certain friend who doesn't listen to this show. And <laughs> both of his little boys, you know who I'm talking about, they're both on their iPhones the whole goddamn time yep. playing video games, and they're being babysat. And this guy... He could talk shit about that. He would talk shit about that. Mm-hmm. But his kids are being babysat by iPhones. Yep. And I love his kids. But I'm going to see how they grow up. By the time right. I have kids, I'm going to learn from the younger millennials what that yeah. does. Because it part of me feels like, like that they're going to well, grow up kind of messed up. <laughs> well, what I've seen uh, with with the kids that grew up like that is they don't know how to sit down and talk to a, another human. They no. don't know yeah. how to have a one-on-one like this, you yeah. know, it's, it's all right there. You know, you, you could go to their birthday party and they open their present and then they're right back on their phone again. And right. it's like, yeah. or their iPad, mm-hmm. it's like, that's their reality. Yeah. It's like real life is not anything. They really know how to do all that much. And it's it, interesting thing to be around when you're around a, a kid who can't even communicate with you or doesn't care about communicating with you. They just want to be on their phone or their iPad. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I don't know. It's just it's it's so different. It's so wild. And it's not good or bad. It's just I have to get used to it's that's different. how they do their thing. Right. And and but it might be bad. I don't know. Like yeah. we won't know for another few decades. I was yeah. gonna say. So we've talked a lot about the the difference of of now to then and the bleak future. Yeah. Well, I mean, we've had. Do you see anything like positive about how things are now in the well, yeah. Generation and well, I'll, I'll I'll give you an example. When yeah. when I started playing guitar, we didn't have YouTube, mm-hmm. we didn't have Google. Um, there were no guitar teachers in Kentucky where I was, so you were kind of by by the seat of your pants, whatever you right. learned. Got to buy a guy some cigarettes. <laughs> yeah, you got to buy the guy some cigarettes, so you he'll show you a lick. And um, you know, for me, I would try to play along with records like everybody did, and. All the songs were like in F sharp and A flat and C sharp. <laughs> and somebody said, you ever heard of standard tuning? 
I'm like, shit, no, I never heard of standard tuning. <laughs> and so somebody tuned my guitar up to standard tuning, and I could play well along with the records. They were in E and A like it's and D. It's a Christmas D. miracle. Yeah, it was a Christmas miracle. <laughs> but now, you know, there's so many phenomenal young players out there because they can go to YouTube, and they can watch anything, and they can learn anything. And you see some of these kids that are on there that are, you know, not even 10 years old, and they're smoking it like Van Halen or right. S- Stevie Ray Vaughan. And I think that's a, a good thing that you have all this stuff at your fingertips to make you be as great as you can possibly be and see how somebody does it and go, oh, I can do that. Well, what else can I do? And, you know, for me, it was just a struggle for three or four years to even just kind of figure out what the hell was going on. And now in two months, these kids can play like Van Halen by watching the videos on YouTube. And I think that's great. Yeah, it is incredible. All, All information is just free now. Yeah. Exactly. And and in medicine, you know, things are moving so fast. What used to be a terrible operation 10 years ago can now be done with computers or whatever. And you walk out of there the same day after a hip replacement or whatever, you know, and all that stuff's great. It's just, it's the yin and the yang of, of right. the, the mm. benefits and the non-benefits yeah. of what stuff is. Yeah, you still got to remember what you're losing for that. Yes, exactly. you ha- It's always a give and take. If you want this, you're giving up something else. Right, exactly. Nothing's free. Yeah. Man. Yeah. Well, now we do gotta get out of here uh, pretty soon here, but we do have. No, uh, I'm sad. There's so oh, much no. left on the table. For, <laughs> I, know, you know, I know. I know. I know. A preview of things to come. We didn't even talk about. He wasn't a yogi. What was the guy you were telling me about off air? Oh yeah, uh, Gary Bell's guy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, mm-hmm. Sai Baba. Sai Baba. Sai Baba in India. You can look him up. He was an avatar who could be in two places, three places at the same time. I wanted to talk about and, that the whole episode. Yeah. You should have brought it up. <laughs> I know. There's well, too much good shit. Yeah, and um, an amazing guy who did a lot of phenomenal things in India as far as uh, Gary helped him open up hospitals for people and schools for kids or whatever. But um, if you go online and Google him, you know, there's a lot of people just like everything else that said, well, you know, he's bullshit or whatever. Of course. But... Um, you know, Gary's got rings the guy manifested out of his hand, you know, and, and gave him the Gary. And it's like, okay, that sure doesn't look like a, a trick of the trade to me. But um, We could have talked about that the whole time. Yeah, next Probably, time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> next yeah, yeah, time. Yeah. Yeah. So for oh, round two. Next time on Music World. Right out. <laughs> um, Baba. But. We do have one question that we ask every guest. Okay. <laughs> uh oh. Now, continuing our story, after Vietnam, no, a little God. movie came out <laughs> called Jaws. Right. <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, if you had to choose, and uh-huh. you do, okay, and you do, okay. <laughs> now, the important thing to note about this question is the answer must not come from here, right? And for everybody who's listening, can't see us, he's pointing to his head. That's right. Right. Uh, well, you know, I, I like it when the answers don't come from your head when it's yeah. more of a must come from here. perception. Yeah, yeah, you know, heart. Now, for you, you say heart, but but I usually say soul after. So. But Kent. Has seen a guy manifest rings, so <laughs> right. you said perception. Right, that's a whole nother fucking level. It is. It's a whole nother level. Whole nother. Yeah. Level. Yeah. yeah. So for the video only listeners, this question must come from your perception. Okay, I like that. Mm-hmm. Now, if you had to choose, yeah. And you do. And you do. I do. You do. <laughs> Now what that there's actually there's means. Time asking there's this not a question. C no. or a B or a. Uh, <laughs> now, what that actually means, coming from your perception, uh huh, is I need an answer <laughs> quickly. Okay. I don't want you to think about it. Yes. As soon as we ask the question, oh, yeah. answer. Okay. Gotcha. <laughs> if you had to choose, and you uh-huh. do, and you do, <laughs> what would you say is your favorite kind of turtle? Loggerhead. Ooh. All right. That's, I don't think that I'm... is the first time we've heard Loggerhead. <laughs> <laughs> we ask everyone this question, you, and that's bitches, a fresh answer. You hear that Gen Z? Now, our audience, uh, on, on according to Spotify demographics, I think it's like our the biggest audience for us is like 25. To 35. Oh, about. I'm fucked. Uh, to 32. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. I hope, by the way, if you're watching, if you made it this far, I hope you saw an interesting <laughs> perspective from a man that... that Anyway, I hope I hope you got this far cuz this was awesome. But mm-hmm. <laughs> Gen Z's 
Not one of you said loggerhead before because this is the wisdom of an older generation. Tell us about a lot. What is even a loggerhead turtle? Well, so um, I've been doing a benefit in West Palm Beach, Florida for kids for it'll be 20 years now. And uh, on the place where they put us up on the beach, loggerhead turtles come in and they lay their eggs. And so you're walking along and there's... um, you know, signs about don't come here because oh, there's put a picture up. there's Eric loggerheads or whatever. And they're huh. amazing turtles, you know, and they they're come pretty. back to the same place every year. But once again, the environment and the heat, uh, climate change is making a big difference on how many show up or how many babies live or whatever. So there's a big community down there in West Palm Beach that's trying to help them come back from what they've lost from climate change. So oh, wow. that's how I know about them. That's crazy. Wow. Yeah, it's not. It's Otherwise, not I would have said of. a box turtle that shows up at my <laughs> house. Everyone that, says yes. Yeah, <laughs> my dog's always trying to catch. You know. Yeah. The most common thing we hear, we always hear snapping turtle. Right. And then box is number two. You know, and yeah. at, at Radnor Lake, if you ever go out there, there's mm-hmm. alligator turtles. Yeah, them dangerous. Yeah. Yeah, you yeah. want to stay away from that. Yeah. <laughs> mm. They can they can take off they can take off they a finger take, no yeah, problem. They take off a dog nose like that. You know. Yeah. And they act like they're really slow. They and then not. all of a sudden they just. Jump up yeah. and take off your nose. I watched a video of one of them um, eating a pineapple. Like they'd hold up, just to show how strong the bite is, they just held right. a pineapple up and it just destroyed it. Like right. it wasn't even like paper, like nothing. Right. I know. Like it can do that. Like I, it's hard to break into a pineapple. Yeah. You know, that thing could take my arm off. He's got that uh, strong okay, mouth like a, a Rottweiler or something like that. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I didn't even get a chance to ask you about dogs because I saw on your Instagram <laughs> that you had said that you, you're a big fan of dogs. Right. Yeah. And I didn't even get a chance. They oh. seem to find me. In fact, I've got them out in the car when you're talking about taking an Uber home. It's like, well, I could, but I got my dogs in the Oh, truck. do you have them in there? Yeah. What kind of dogs you got? Uh, I have a mutt and I have a Labradoodle that was rescued off hmm. Craigslist. Oh, wow. And I just lost a lab at 16 years oh, last year. Rough. But um, it was funny. They've been kind of, I've been doing stuff with these out-of-town people. So I got ready to go, and I was got my guitar and opened the door, and, boy, they just both went out like, I need to do something. Take yeah. me somewhere. <laughs> so they hopped in the car, and they're, yeah. they're out there. And the one dog, she'll just wait hours for me in the car. She yeah. would live in the car. Yeah. So. And for anybody listening, like the weather is like great right yeah, now. It's, it's not it's hot weird. or anything. No, like, I don't they're take good. They're good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like so that. don't worry about that. If you're like about to type in an angry comment below. Yeah. Like it's fine. No, yeah. they're 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 very very happy dogs and most of mine live to be sixteen years old, so I don't think wow. I have to worry about that. Man, that's that's yeah, that's it's old. Pretty cool. Yeah. Now me and my wife love dogs. We we, we have a corgi is what right. our dog is which dogs. they're they're adorable. They're very yeah. stubborn. Yeah. Uh, plus, it's Queen's dog, you know. They should be stubborn. Sure, they ought to be stubborn. Yeah. <laughs> but I think uh, we want to pick up uh, eventually our plans to get a white Swiss Shepherd. I don't know uh-huh. if you've ever seen them. Yeah, they're beautiful. Oh, they're amazing. And we just met one. And they're really the, smart, too. Yeah, I like a smart dog. I do, too. Um, sometimes, though, I'm like, smart. I could go for a dumb dog sometimes. Yeah. You know? <laughs> well, we have, yeah, the little white mutt. He's kind of a dumb one. But the, the doodles are really smart. This is the second one I've had, and the labs are really smart. But the oh, yeah. thing about a doodle is, or a lab, you can tell them to do something, and they'll do it. Mm-hmm. And the doodles, you ask, tell them to do something, they'll think about it. Yeah. Let me see if I want to do that or oh, not. Oh, yeah. And you can see them, and you know they they know what you're saying. Yeah. They understand. I They're don't just really want to do that. choosing not to. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah, so. Corgis are just like that. I'll be like, come over here. And he'll just look at me like, meh. I will when I want to. Yeah, we'll, we'll get there when we get there. Yeah, like, exactly. <laughs> I'm busy. But... Um, anyways, uh, we're going to go out yeah. on so, a song off Spotify. Yeah. Or... So we usually play a song if, that the artist has done at the very end after we're done. Now, here's my question for you. So I have a question this time. I don't usually do a question, but I have okay. a question. It's probably a dumb question. I have an answer. But <laughs> do you have like a favorite song you ever wrote? You know, I would have to say it's If Tomorrow Never Comes just because – for a number of reasons, it was a song that uh, I'd always wanted to write that gave that tell the people you love how you feel about them. We wrote it for our wives, and um, mine passed away, so that song was very relevant. But it also started Garth's career, mm-hmm. and um, so it still remains my favorite song. It's wow. kind of like that song I always wished I'd write that I wrote. Oh, wow. Yeah, wow. Now, oh, dang. that was a little early, but you'll see. Uh, okay. <laughs> now, uh, it did your wife pass away back then, that far away? That, that No, she passed away right about the time Danny Gokey's wife passed away, 2009. Really? Oh, wow. Oh, wow, yeah. yeah, about the same time. Mm-hmm. 
what a full circle what a like a full circle isn't the right word it's full circle for me because i've been knowing and working with danny for a long time and it's kind of coming to me 30 minutes later but i'm like i feel like i've heard him from stage talk about you like mm-hmm. about like just how the song came about right and like some at some point in time but what a synchronicity that that song with it came out of that you know your wife passing at that time and then it went to him and his wife passing and i don't know that transference of writer to artist and then it impacting the world is just a really crazy thing well and that's that same thing about wanting to to write something that will make people think there's a possibility on what else is possible you know because uh that's what my best days was all about for anybody you know mm. if you say mm. i'm 34 and i'm old then you're 34 and you're old but if you go right. hey you know tomorrow's going to be better than today then that's what's going to show up. So wow. I'm all about that. And, um, you know, I just love that Danny and I kind of went through the same thing at the same time. In fact, the Tennessean did a really big article on the two of us when that song came out. And oh, really? uh, that's when I found out more about Danny and his wife. I didn't know that at first till that article came out. And I'm like, well, this is really kind of cool, yeah. you know, in a sad sort of way. But if it's helping other people, that's what it's all about. Right. It's a good way to look yeah. at it. Well, I'm going to see him next weekend, and I'm going to tell well, him no, all yeah. about this. Awesome. It's just what a cool thing. Yeah. Well, Kent, it was incredible to have you. Uh, you you do the sign up. I want to sign us off right now, but I'm not going <laughs> to. That's my job. That's his job. Okay. But this, but after well, he does his thing, then it's going to be If Tomorrow Never Comes. Okay. Well, thank you, guys. For you. It's, yeah. it's phenomenal. Yeah, thanks for coming out. Mm-hmm. Thank you. And as always, guys, thanks, everyone, for coming to hang out. You guys are awesome, and we'll see you all next time. Woohoo! I didn't come here to hear me. What's that? I didn't come here to hear me. Let's do you then. Yes. Sometimes late at night, I lie awake and watch her sleeping. She's lost in peaceful dreams, so I turn out the lights and lay there. And the thought crosses my mind If I never wake up in the morning Would she ever doubt The way I feel about her in my heart If tomorrow never Will she know how much I loved her? Did I try in every way To show her every day That she's my only one And if my time on earth were through And she must face this world without me is the love I gave her in the past Gonna be enough to last If tomorrow never comes Cause I've lost loved ones in my life Who never knew how much I love them Now I live with the regret that my true feelings for them never were revealed. So I made a promise to myself to say each day how much she means to me and avoid that circumstance where there's no second chance. Tell her how I feel Cause if tomorrow never comes Will she know how much I loved her? Did I try in every way To show her every day That 
she's my only one If my time on earth were through She must face this world without me Is the love I gave her in the past Gonna be enough to last If tomorrow never comes hey. So tell that someone that you love just what you're thinking of If tomorrow never comes Darth Brooks Kim Blazing.